refuse to give ourselves to principles, we cut short our own lives. We are, um, um, today we're going to be dealing um, from verse 23, but I'll just take it very quickly. I'm reading from um, the new NIV. It says, gather the people, consecrate the assembly, bring together the elders, gather the children, those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride head chamber. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the portico and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn. A byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? That the Lord was jealous for his land and took pity on his people. The Lord replied to them, I am sending you grain, new wine and olive oil, enough to satisfy you fully. Never again will I make you an object of scorn to the nations. I will drive the northern hot far from you, pushing it into a parched and barren land. Its eastern ranks will drown in the Dead Sea and its western ranks in the Mediterranean Sea. And its stench will go up, its smell will rise. Surely he has done great things. Do not be afraid, land of Judah. Be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. Do not be afraid, you wild animals, for the pastures in the wilderness are becoming green. The trees are bearing their fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their riches. Verse 23. Be glad, people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the autumn rains because he is faithful. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains as before. The threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locust and the young locust, the other locust and the locust swarm, my great army that I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and that there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. Amen. We'll read the rest later next week. We'll do with that. That is amazing, isn't it? I love the word of God. It's so beautiful as we read it. We thank the Lord. Today, as I said, we're doing... And from verse 23, the scripture applies to us because the Lord will have us know. And in there is packed a lot of goodies and blessings and direction that the Lord will have us know. Verse 23 tells us that we should be glad, people of FCI. We should rejoice in the Lord your God. I think it's Paul that says, rejoice and again I say rejoice. It was very important that we have an attitude of praise. Amen. That no matter what, as well, the world is full of challenges. It comes, it goes, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. But it's the attitude in which we deal with things. That no matter the situation, no matter how hard it is, we must train ourselves to have an attitude where we're always glad. Because the Bible also clearly tells us that in all things we should give God thanks because it is the will of God concerning us. So that means that it's God's will, <clears throat> excuse me, that we must always be glad and we must always rejoice, even when it doesn't look like so. But in this particular situation, God is speaking to you and, us, uh, you and I and telling us that we should be glad. We should rejoice. Why? Because he is doing wonders amongst us. So what he's saying is that we must always rejoice and must always be glad because God is always doing good. The scripture tells us in the book of Romans that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Do you love the Lord? You do. Okay. Are you called according to his purpose? Yeah. Then every single situation will work together for good. So if everything works together for you good, that means that all the time good things will happen to you. So I hear you say, but why do bad things happen to good people? I don't have 20 hours or a few days, so I can't say that. <clears throat> Sometimes bad things do happen. But let's go back to the scripture. All things work together for good. Joseph said something to his brothers, and I love that scripture. 
Joseph, after he had met his brothers, revealed himself to his brothers and all that. He told his brothers, now, you had meant things for evil. Because that's exactly what they meant. They were jealous of Joseph. They wanted him to die. Because if they didn't want him to die, they wouldn't have put him in the hole, right? That's a sign of a murderer. Because if you're stuck in a hole, you will not be found and you will die. So they were not brave enough to shoot him or put a spear in him or whatever. But basically, their intentions were that. So any death or anything like that is evil. Then, of course, he went into slavery. They did not know that. But as far as they were concerned, he was what? Dead. But as scripture tells us, all things work together for good for Joseph because he loved the Lord. So after everything, all those years had passed and he met with his brothers, he said, you meant it for evil. But God did what? Turned it around for good. So what am I saying? And what is the Lord trying to let us know that? Sometimes bad things do happen to us. Sometimes people mean to do us evil and they get us. Sometimes things happen without any reason. Sometimes it could be the Lord trying to get your attention. For whatever reason, sometimes it's because we're living in a fallen world. Sometimes we found ourselves in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that's one thing I have been praying for, for myself and for my children. Amen? And I pray that you pray that for yourself. And I pray for the the children, especially the young ones in this ministry. All the time I pray, I say, Lord, let them not find themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, many a time you hear the news and say, there was a passerby and people, there was a gunfight. Boom. Person was in the wrong place at the wrong time. You go and find out that maybe there were things that were blocking them that they shouldn't have gone. But they insisted, I must go. That's why we need the unction of God. That every day when you just have a prompting, sometimes even to the extent that at work, you may actually get prompting. You know, as Pastor say, situational ethics. You may have to call and say, I'm feeling a bit unwell. That's because you're unwell in the spirit. Stay home because you don't know what's going to happen. Amen? But the point as we move on is that God is telling us we should be glad. We should rejoice. Because whether people mean it for good, uh, sorry, for evil, whether what we found ourselves in the wrong place, whether we brought it on ourselves, however the bad thing happened, God is still in control. And he has the ability and he will turn it around for your good. If you love him. Amen. So we must always train ourselves. The reason why now I keep saying train ourselves is because sometimes, unfortunately for us, we're not naturally disposed to a certain things. Some people are just... Um, how do you call it? Some people are very jovial people, right? Or they're very what we call optimistic people. So people like that, it's easy for them. Even in a bad situation, they will joke. Somebody's seen a dead person, they're still laughing. <laughs> Didn't you think it was funny? No. But they can see light still in it because they're there observing the way everybody was crying or something like that. Has it not happened to you before? Sometimes somebody dies and it's a very serious situation. Then afterwards you look over and you start to laugh. It's like, oh, did you see the way your mom was crying? She was falling all over the floor. But it wasn't funny then. But people see situations. But God is telling you and I that no matter the situation, we must train ourselves to have the attitude that, yes, we get robbed. But in the next minute, say, no, God is in control. I must be glad. I must see the good thing in that situation. Somebody died. Let's celebrate the life. But in this situation, if the devil meant it for evil, I know for sure the Lord will turn it around for good. Amen. But why? Anyway, in this particular case, God is telling you and I that rejoice. For he has given you the autumn rains because he is faithful. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains as before. That means the Lord is telling you and I that he's going to give us a double portion. I receive it. A double portion of every blessing that he has for us. The autumn and the spring rains. I understand. I'm not sure if the season is still the same. Maybe possibly it is. But I understand that in Israel, between May and October, it it did not rain. Okay, so for six months, they will have no rain. And obviously, if there's no rain, it is dry. Whereas it's not like a famine, but things start to get very hard. Okay? The crops and all those things begin to get affected. You have to be particular how you eat and all those sort of stuff. Because obviously, if you finish your food before the time, you're in trouble. Okay? So things stop growing. So it's a time, if you like, of famine. It's a time where it's little or no 
productivity. Okay? What I mean to say is that there may be productivity, but it will be minimal because there's no rain. And in some areas, there will be none. So a wise man would have put his storehouse or something like that. So he knows that I can calculate that for the next six months, I'm going to live on this. Do you understand? So they have to live wisely. It's not a time that you live anyhow. So what I'm saying to you is that we go through particular seasons. It may be what is known as a lean season. But while you're going through it, be rest assured that God is in control. Because that's what he's telling us. That there are times where you have to calculate. You don't talk anyhow. We must understand the times and the seasons. Because God works and operates in times and seasons. We know by scripture that in Ecclesiastes it says that there's a time and a season for everything. There's a time to cry. There's a time to laugh. There's a time to sleep. And there's time to pray 24-7. There's a time to eat. And there's a time to fast. When you know it's your time to fast, please don't eat. Because that food will not do you any good. The, uh, the Bible says that some people have made their gods their belly. Really and truly, you will not die. Today, this morning, I don't know if you heard, I caught a very quick um, excerpt about uh, news about some man who was in, um, he was trapped in his car. Did you hear it? Before Christmas, snow, in snow, his car got stuck somewhere. I didn't catch the country, I don't know. But because there was so much snow, his car was engulfed in the snow and the guy was stuck in there. Nobody was passing by before Christmas. But the guy has just been found. Yes, that's what I thought. Wow, as I was quickly getting ready. He's alive. They say he's in a poor condition, but they didn't tell me that it was, well, I didn't hear them say, so I don't know if it was, that he's about to die. Obviously, he's in a poor condition. The guy survived by eating ice. Since before Christmas, they found the guy weak, but yet alive. He survived by eating ice, and most probably a good attitude that I'm going to be found somebody will find me and so because he had that attitude he was willing himself to live amen so we can do without food you know so when it's time to fast we must also fast because we won't die and in the same way we must have that good attitude because that man still had the attitude sometimes we just give up have you not heard that some people die then they die they say oh he had lost the fight because the person was not willing he was ready or kept saying, oh, I don't know, I just want to go. I just want to go. And guess what? They'll be gone because they don't have that spirit. So we must be glad and rejoice. Amen. So there were times where things were hard. But God is saying to rejoice, people of Zion. Because I am faithful, he's given you the autumn rains because he's faithful. The autumn rain was the first rain that came. So what happens is that come autumn, so between May and October, there will be no rain. But towards the end of October, it will start to rain. So between October, I've forgotten the rest of the month, it will start to rain. So that was known as the autumn rain. So the first outpouring of God's spirit is the autumn rain. Some theologians say that uh, the day of Pentecost was known as the autumn rain. Because that was the first coming of the Holy Spirit. So he came and it became the autumn rain. So we had never had an experience with the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was there, all right? But the Holy Spirit chose particular people that he would dwell in. So that's why you have all the prophets and Jeremiah and uh, Isaiah and that. God would choose them and put his spirit in them. So no man could understand what to do, where to go, how God was moving, unless they came to consult them. And so they said, what was God saying? And remember some time back, some months when we were doing about Japheth, the Bible said the Spirit of God came upon Japheth. So at that time, he was full of the Holy Spirit and Samson and all those things. But the autumn rain came. When the Bible, Jesus said, go and wait for me and wait for the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that as the disciples were in the upper room, all of a sudden, the Spirit of God just descended. Thank God for the autumn rain. Because as the autumn rain comes, it brings transformation. Because when the initial uh, encounter with the Holy Spirit came, the Bible clearly tells us in the book of Acts that the disciples, remember, they were in the room. The Bible says that they had locked the room. 
Not only were they in a room, but anytime you lock a room, there's one reason why you want privacy, yeah? In this particular case, it's because they were afraid. If you're running from somebody, you go into the room and you do what? You lock it. So when the person comes, they cannot have easy access. So they were afraid because they were worried. Well, well, these people are going to catch us. But even though they were afraid, immediately the Spirit of God came. They, not only did they open the door, they went out, watched the transformation. These are people who are afraid, have hidden themselves. But as soon as the autumn rain came, they went out and they started. The Bible says that it was a Pentecost, season of Pentecost. So people had come from all over the world. If you imagine, it's like Olympics. People had come and gathered to celebrate the festival of Pentecost. But as they came, they went and stood in front of all these people, were not even afraid. The Bible said, and Peter began to preach the gospel. And then the disciples began to speak in other tongues so that the people from wherever the corners of the world began to hear the gospel for the first time. Wow, what are these people talking about? So it's important for the autumn rains. So therefore we must be glad and rejoice. Because when the autumn rain comes, it brings you a transformation. Do we understand? So what are we talking about in our lives? When we are going through those dryness, the times where it's not raining, the times that you're finding it difficult, the time that you're plodding on, be glad and rejoice. For God has not left you. Neither has he abandoned you. He hasn't me either. Because he said, because I am faithful, I bring you the autumn rain. So immediately it starts to rain, you are happy. Because that bed that you have, I don't know anything about agriculture, so forgive me. The thing that you've been trying to plant, all of a sudden the water starts to come. It makes a difference. All of a sudden your plant starts to grow. All of a sudden you have water in your water bar. Remember they don't have anything. Even now in modern times, sometimes they'll tell us we have hose water um, ban because the wells are running dry. They're, what's it called? Res whatever. Thank you. The reservoir is running dry. We still need the rain. It makes a difference for us. Amen. He is a faithful God. So he says, be glad, rejoice. I have not abandoned you. I'm bringing you the autumn rain. I'm preaching to myself. So I thank you, Lord, that you've given me the autumn rain. But listen to our God, who does exceedingly abundantly about. And he is still our God. He spoke in the time of Joel, and he's speaking to you and I today. The word is relevant to us today. He says, because I am faithful, I give you the autumn rain. But listen to this. That's why I started by saying he gives us a double portion. He says, he sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains as before. What is the difference between the autumn and the spring rain? I've already explained to you about the autumn rain. It comes in a time when it's dry. But after the autumn rain comes the spring. Obviously, if it's rained in the autumn... Okay, it starts from October and it goes to December, sometimes even January. Are, are you with me? So that's when the autumn rain goes. It goes from the end of October, November, December, then it ends sometimes in January. Now, here comes the spring rain. Now, when the autumn rain finishes, October, November, December, if you get over, or, or a bonus, you get January. You only have two months from the autumn rain to the spring rain which starts in March is somebody understanding me so the land is what not dry the land has been fed are we understanding the land has been watered it has not had six months of no rain it is not dry so you have had the presence of the Holy Spirit already the autumn rain but he did not leave you just like that. Though you have just finished the autumn rain, though you've just had an encounter with God, so now things are not so bad. They're good. But he says, I'm not just going to leave you like that because I am the one that gives you overflow. Remember, the Spirit of God, uh, the Bible tells us that do not be drunk with wine, which leads to excess debauchery and stuff like that. He says what? Well, but be filled with the Spirit of God. He's talking about that continuous infilling of overflow because our God does exceedingly abundant and every time he wants us to have overflow. Even in the time when Jesus, the first miracle, he turns water into the wine, he, there was overflow. Jesus could have said, okay, let's count. How many people are left? 
one, two, three, this table, okay, on every table sits 10. We have 10 tables left, so 10 times 10. So we have 100 people left who do not have wine, yeah? See, maybe if that was me, that's what I would have done. So how many people do you say? 100. So I said, okay, now I'm going to do the miracle. Lord, give 100 people wine. But notice, at that first miracle, Jesus did not even bother to ask how many people. He said, the wine has run out. After Mary had convinced him, go ahead and do it, he did what? He just did the overflow. So the MC said, ah, oh, wow, look at this, excess. And so that's what the Lord does, and I'm so grateful for the spring rains. He says, I give it in abundance, abundant showers of the autumn, because I could have left it at autumn, but I choose not to. Listen to the words, I choose not to. Because I could say to you, I could decide to bless you. How much money did you say you need? Right? Do you say, I need a hundred pounds to pay my bill. Can you please give me a hundred pounds? Yeah? So I do what I give you a hundred pounds because that's what you ask me for. I give it to you. Yeah? Because that's what you need. But I can also choose to give you two hundred pounds. Even though you ask for a hundred pounds. Do you understand? Because I want to bless you. And that's what God wants to do. He doesn't just want to bless his people because we have a need. Of course, that's, that's what he does. He's God. He's Jehovah Jireh, the one who sees the need and then he provides. But when he provides, look what our God does. He always provides over. That's the attitude we must have. In blessing, let's bless over. In entertaining, let's bless. You know, some of our grandmothers, oh, you didn't get that. Your grandmother will cook and tell you that it doesn't matter. You never know who else is going to come. Keep cooking, big pots are, but the only few, they tell you because somebody might just walk in. And that's a good attitude. Sometimes we think, oh, these people, they don't know what they're doing. But it's a sign of a, of a hospitable person. And just put in the fridge. So, so you people just waste food. But if somebody just walks up the street and says, hey, I'm really hungry, so you sit there. Don't you know people like that? Some people, there's always something at the bottom of a freezer, isn't it? Amen? All of a sudden, chinking, 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 then here comes this wonderful meal. I'm supposed to go into a house. Do you have anything? Oh, I'm so sorry. All I have is government juice. Do you know what government juice is? It's tap water. <laughs> tap water is known as government juice. Even now, we pay for the tap water anyway. Amen. But that's what the Lord will have us know. The be glad and rejoice because I give you that. So that autumn rain comes to revive, uh, in my notes I wrote, it revives the parched and thirsty soul. Amen. But what the spring rain does, it gives you a refreshing. It gives you that overflow. It gives you that spring in your step. Amen. And that's what we're going to pray for today. Because he's given it to us already anyway. That we may walk in that. Both the autumn and the spring rains. So there's no point for us to be glum. We cannot be just like those ordinary people. We cannot be. As Isaiah clearly put it. Don't fear what they fear. Don't call conspiracy what they call conspiracy. Because we are of a different spirit. And so we must train ourselves. And that's why we come to church to hear his word. That we may be equipped to live an abundant and effective life. And then also we can be equipped to minister the gospel. To do the work of an evangelist. To come and learn. Do not be conformed to the things of the word. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Today, as pastor says, it's time to shave your brain. It's time to understand that no matter the situation, we must be glad. We must rejoice. Dorothy, you tell yourself, be glad, rejoice. Because God, our God, gives you both the autumn and the spring rains in abundance. Amen. The next verse continues. He says, the threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. Amen. The threshing floor. The threshing floor in the olden days, I don't know if they probably still have that. It's almost like a, a storehouse. So when it's harvest time, you take your grain and all of that and you go put it. If you like, the way I can imagine is like a big, massive warehouse. Okay? And so 
you put the grain in there. I understand in some communities or villages, individuals, if you are rich, you may have your own threshing floor. Okay? So, um, well, what's his name? Gideon was in his threshing floor. Presumably, he was in his family. I don't know. But you can have your own family, like the Fosurai threshing floor. You write on it. So you put your grain in there. Or in a community, they'll have the whole community's threshing floor. And then they will divide it. This is Ophosurai's part. This is the Jones's part. The Smith's part. So once it's harvest time, everybody harvests and put all the grain in there. Now, if you know anything to do with grain, rice and all that, they're all grain, isn't it? It has like, what, what do they call it? The chaff. The chaff is over the grain itself, okay? So they put the thing. And when it gets to harvest time, the time for you to harvest it. What they do is that they will start to thresh. That's why it's called the threshing floor. So they will do something to make sure that they separate the grain from the chaff. Amen. And that is why the scripture tells us that the time is coming that he will pluck the weeds from the, the, the good plant. And then in the same way, he said that he will separate the wheat from the chaff. Do you understand? So there's a time in this, the church's time that, you know, scripture tells us in Jude that there's some people that have crept in unawares. There's some bad apples in the mix and all that. And it's like God is blind or he's deaf. Not that he's blind or he's deaf, but the appointed time hasn't come, just like a farmer. So he gathers all Tom, Dick and Harry and everybody comes in. But the time comes when the farmer comes and he starts to beat the thing. So when he beats it, the, he takes his grain and then he separates the chaff. And so I understand that what they do uh, is that they use something, whether it's a, I don't know, like a fork or whatever. When they finish, they go like that and blow it. And the chaff starts to blow to the wind. Are you understanding something? Amen? Are you understanding something? He says the threshing floor will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine. It is good for the threshing floor to be filled with grain. Because we know we've got a bumper harvest. And so we want to thank the Lord that our threshing floor is filled. Amen. That when the harvest came in and there was abundance, because he's given us the autumn and the spring rains, it means that we will harvest good. So we, it's time for harvest. For the sickle has been brought to the root. So you will always remember this is our time for harvest. Next year is also a time for harvest. Next, the one after that is a time for harvest. We will seasonally be in time of harvest if we remain in the Lord. That is why tell, God tells us be glad and rejoice. Do you understand? It is not just for that time when he's speaking. Are we understanding? I want you us to understand this. Because this must be a constant attitude that we must have. For every time and every season, whether it's good, bad, or ugly, whether things are hard or not, the threshing floor is filled with grain. Amen? Because as children of God, we are always in our season. We are always in our season. So he tells us that the threshing floor will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine. The vat also, you have them, they're like big, massive barrels that they put the wine in, okay? And then they store them. I don't know anything about wine. I'm sure some of you do. But you know when you watch those um, documentaries or those wine tasters, they do all that. They go get the, um, the wine from the vat and they can keep it for years and years. It's going back to the threshing floor. The threshing floor is a place of abundance. It means that you can see your grain. Whether you've got a family threshing floor, you go and you look and say, like, oh my God. ka -ching! You see the pound signs in your eyes. You know for sure this is a good one. Because as Pastor de describes faith to us, the money may not be in your pocket. But as soon as you see that uh, grain, you know that you're already there. Because once you separate the wheat from the chaff, you take it to the market, they're going to buy it. It becomes money in your pocket. So you see and know and understand that it is well because you've got the money. You've got everything that you need because your threshing floor is filled with grain. So it's a place of abundance. It's a place of rejoicing. No matter what situation, no matter the economic situation, no matter what, our threshing floor is full of grain. Amen. It's a place of abundance. Again, the threshing floor is also a place of judgment. Remember, but I started by quoting the scripture when it talks about I'm about to separate the wheat from the chaff. Moses said, I present before you life and death, 
but I would rather that you chose life. Joshua said, decide today whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, the decision I have made. We are at a place of abundance, of overflow. But also at that place is a place of judgment. Because as the, the, I don't know what they call it, the fork or whatever it is that they used to separate the wheat from the chaff. Remember, the chaff is blown to the wind. The chaff is discarded. So we must make sure that we position ourselves right. When God, our farmer, takes his, his winnowing fork and he starts to dig deep and starts going like that, that we will not be blown away like the wind. If we decide that we will not stay with God and run with the vision, the blessings that he's given us, we will not take it and run with it, then we will be part of the judgment and part of that um, chaff that has been blown to the wind. But we persuade you by the word of God, persuade you by scripture, persuade you that you will choose life. The decision I cannot make for you, I have to make my own. Amen. But the threshing floor is full with grain. The vats is overflow with new wine and oil. As we know, we taught it, we've said it before, new wine and oil are symbols of the Holy Spirit. So that the abundance of the Holy Spirit is very important. Very quickly, let's read verse um, 25. It says, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locusts and the young locusts, the other locusts and the locust swarm, my great army that I sent amongst you. You have plenty to eat. And then he goes on. In scripture, in Old Testament scripture, if a thief is caught, unlike African judgment, if you catch a thief, what they do is that they whip the chief, uh, the, sorry, the thief, and beat, uh, beat the person. Sometimes they even kill people who have stolen. But in Old Testament time, if you catch a thief, the thief must do what? Do you know what a thief must do? The thief must pay back restitution. They must pay back what they have stolen. And in some cases, they must add on. So you might as well not steal. If you're stealing because you don't have, then you put yourself into trouble by actually giving what you don't have already and then having to add on. So you have to compensate. You have to give restitution. So that scripture, even in the Ten Commandments, it tells us we should not steal and all that. And so what God is telling us is that the law that he has set down, that if anybody steals from you, it's payback time. Amen. Pay back time. And so in this particular case, God is talking about the locust. The locust is representative of the enemy at that time. So when the locusts came, and at that time, literally, it was literally locusts, because the locusts, because they had gone against God, God sent locusts. And he says, look, you people, I'm going to punish you. So when the locusts came, they came and ate up all their, their um, what do you call it, their plants, their crops and everything. So they could not harvest. So this is a representative of the devil. Because what the devil does, according to the book of John, is what? To kill, to steal, and to destroy. And saints, no matter how beautiful we are, no matter how eloquent we are, no matter how educated we are, no matter how spiritual or non-spiritual we are, the devil is a bad devil and he's out to get you. For war has been declared. Oh, me, I'm not afraid of that. Me, I'm not. Don't, hey, don't kid yourself. The devil's plan is to disgrace you. And to disgrace you in such a way, a way that everybody will see your disgrace. That's the devil's plan. To make sure that nothing you put your hand to will prosper. To get you begging. To get you looking tattered. To get you dying. Taking your life from you. That's the devil's plan. But God is telling you and I that don't you worry. He says, well, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. The great locusts and the young locusts. And he goes on my great army that I sent unto you. So everything that the devil has stolen from you. As you remain in his house and you remain in him, it's payback time. Not even double. I wish somebody would receive this. We sing everything now double, double. Gosh, I was singing. No double. He's not going to pay you double. Because that's not actually scriptural. He pays back seven times. Seven times. Seven times. 
So what has the enemy stolen from you? It could be your joy. It's payback time. It could be your finances. Payback time. It could be your marriage. It's payback time. No matter what the enemy has stolen, he will keep coming. He will keep stealing. But we need to position ourselves so that when the devil comes near our things, you know, just like you put, um, you put some uh, sting on it, he puts his hand and goes, Pim! he cannot hold on to it. Because as we intensify our prayer, as we intensify our walk in the Lord, the Bible says this, that when the spirit, uh, uh, when the enemy comes in like a, a flood, what happens? The spirit of the Lord raises a standard. Why does God raise a standard? Because he's here to protect you and I that in a constant communion with him. Because the Bible says those of us who call upon the name of the Lord will never be put to shame. It said never be put to shame. Disgrace is far removed. For I hear the Lord say to Peter, for the devil sought to sift you. But I have prayed for you. Why did Jesus pray for Peter? Because Peter was in constant communion with him. And he knew that if Peter was disgraced, his name would be disgraced. If you are disgraced because you're always in the house of the Lord, you, you have said that, let me be buried in the car park. You have declared your intention. Everybody knows you to be a believer. Everybody knows you to be a member of Freedom Center International. So when the, day, the devil comes and he grabs you, everybody's like, ah, she said she was a Christian. His name has been brought to disrepute. And so because we're in the Lord, we can only get that blessing if we're in constant communion with him. If we are in constant communion with him, everything that the locust has taken, everything that the, the big, the grandfather locust, the small baby locust has taken, is payback time. Somebody, lift up your hands. Want to rise with me as we bring the service to a close. Our mission is raising overcomers, setting the captives free. Freedom Center International is here to support you in every step that you take with the Word of God as you seek spiritual and emotional wholeness. And we hope you've been blessed by today's message. Worship with us at 38 Upper Wickham Lane, Welling, Kent, DA16 3HF or give us a call on 0207-277-8700. You can also visit us online at fcichapel.org. And remember, there is progress in freedom.